a scion of many worlds. Fuck, fuck, fuck. Where is our backup? I told you fuckers to get your asses ready, Horus demands into his communicator. We have another teleport prepped, but what the hell do we do in a situation like this? Control asks on the approaching ship. Get them a caster blaster with a black shell loadout and get them close to the action to coordinate with the locals. The water supply needs to be drained and cut off. Horus orders and nearly rolls his eyes. He can't take a shot now. The explosion from the steam would flash Cook Jasper if it doesn't outright shatter the barrier. He no longer has any reason to believe that the most powerful weapon he's ever laid his augmented hands on will be anything more than a fucking laser pointer now. The weapon itself is worth billions of credits, and it's just a fucking paperweight. All right, Cherizard is coming down, Control says, and Horace nods. In the distance, he can see the distortion as a bright blast of light erupts over Jasper's war camp. The repulse wings extend from the armor and he goes from falling to carefully descending. His helmet is retracting as he does so, revealing Sergeant Major Jared Sampson. One of the local recruits in the galaxy, a fire Araminta, chosen for the mission and reassigned to Titan squad training on the trip over so that they have a good layout of local races to make peace with the people here. Jasper being an Urthani was a good start, but more was needed. And a fire Araminta? That fit right in. The world is wet and compressing. The Shadow's game is now obvious. Since attacks that require any kind of aiming on her part have failed, she's not going to bother aiming. She's just going to fill the area with as much water as she can and try to kill him with the pressure, the cold, or the lack of oxygen. Either she kills him and the field drops or he lets the water out and he creates a weakness she can escape through. After that, the game is completely in her favor. Unfortunately for her, the fact that a person can set themselves out of phase with the local states of matter doesn't really help. The water is moving through him in the most literal way imaginable, and she's just going to screw herself at this rate. There is a distortion outside the field, and he pushes back on the water before phasing in. Who just arrived? Call me Cherizar, though Jared will do. I tried to get them to call me the Fire Titan, but no, I have to be nicknamed after a children's cartoon character, and not even a person, a freaking animal. Cherizard complains for a moment. Who do I talk to about getting that wall closed to stop more water from getting in? Terry. She's a powerful Earth Araminta, usually carrying around a huge piece of personally made equipment and with short hair. Stoic and focused personality, Jasper calls back. The water pressure increases, and he feels the conjured air pocket expand. All right, I'm on it. Good man. I'm about to do something crazy to try and crack her focus, but I think she's, she's using spiritual tethers as axiom totems. Oh fuck, that's possible. How? The water blasts in and his focus nearly wavers as the crushing pressure slams at him. The shadow makes no move to stop it and he can sense her amusement. So he starts splitting the oxygen and hydrogen. A little flick and he goes from his temporary offense and back into defense and fades away before the concussive wave can slam into him. The water shatters and a fair amount is dropped, but he feels her pull on more, only to find less. He fades back in now that there's a bit of air to fly in. Also, it will keep her focused on him being out of the water rather than that there's less of it. His communicator vibrates and gives off a burst of babble before it shifts to accommodate the differences needed to communicate underwater. Stand by for Event Horizon. Then there's a brutally complicated touch of axiom work that condenses in on itself and shifts. The water and air both are ripped away into a hole the size of a baseball that drinks entire oceans, even as Jasper flies away frantically. The shadow is unmoved. It appears that the other direction's own rules completely trump standard physics. That, that's going to be very hard to get past. He is still everything he promised himself in the mirror, the unrelenting inferno consuming all, the great tree, ever alive and seeking more life, 
the endless mountain, unyielding and impossible vast, the flawless gemstone, made only stronger and clearer by the pressure, and finally, the unknowable ocean, flowing around all obstacles and wearing them down with ease. He brings it all together again. He sends his own axiom into the black hole construct and alters its intention. It continues and the pressure changes. No longer merely a consuming void about to burst, it has purpose and calling. He charges the shadow and his claws crack and tear against her shield of souls, but he smiles regardless. The sheer energies taint the falling blood and claw shards, the blood and shards that are pulled through the air and into the black hole. He charges her thrice more, cracking and crumbling his claws as he does so. The howling din of the black hole is tearing at light and wind in all things. Grazer blasts are partially bled off into the hole and he opens several more arrays. A tuned gamma radiation also makes its way into the black hole as more and more of the ocean is swallowed up by the singularity. The water cuts off and it only has air to take. As predictable as a sunrise, the shadow tries to turn the black hole against him by forcing him to it. It's a classic tactic, make your enemy eat their own attack. It's pretty much the first thing anyone in a fight thinks about. The first thing you want to do when someone pulls a knife on you or picks up a rock is make the bastard eat it. Unfortunately for her, he's turned the black hole into a molecular forge, something that's only a rumor of possibility on the atomic scale on Earth, but possible, in theory, with Axiom. In practice, it's so energy and control intensive that it's just not worth the time. But with the singularity provided, he only needs to lasso it for a ride. With his own DNA and axiom presence fed into it, it's already attuned to him. With energies from the other direction saturating that blood and keratin, well, now he's cooking with gas. He accelerates his own temporal awareness and everything slows down. He is now approaching the black hole at speeds a snail would find slow. He starts poking it prodding it and modifying it, shifting it as it goes, compressing neutrons, protons and electrons in very specific patterns to force things together. The axiom, omnipresent and very reactive, help him shift things. It slowly becomes metallic, but it's taking its cues from the keratin and the blood. The metal shifts ever so slightly and it is infused with the power of the other direction. Absently, part of Jasper wonders if this will cause him to go from resembling a white silk moth to a death's head moth. Either way, however, it works. As he would crash into the black hole, the energy is released and he thrusts his right claw into it. If it fails, he's only down an arm. When he's killed the shadow, he can grow another with a healing coma or get a synthetic replacement. No big deal, either way. He pulls. He pulls the living soul steel he's made into his claw and bones. It breathes into him, phasing through his being. It is attuned to him, and attuned properly to the other direction. The pain is immeasurable. His focus wavers as he tries to harden himself against it, and he slams into the now solid barrier as he feels every touch of keratin, blood, and bone in his body shift. His skeleton, exoskeleton, fur and claws all take on a shimmering, shining aspect as he feels the other direction slam into him. It's over in moments, but his axiom expanded awareness made it feel like millennia. He takes a deep sucking breath to try and steady himself, his claws gouging away through the defensive barrier. That he was able to maintain it even in the three seconds all this happened in real time and 3,000 years it felt like is impressive. His wings snap out and he takes off. He's slightly heavier than before, but that's not something he'll complain about. Well, not seriously. What did you do? The shadow demands. What I always do. He answers as he rises up with ease. He can feel fear from her. Before it was just annoyance and incredulity, but now she's afraid. I prove myself undaunted. What? She asks, and he rushes forward. 
This time his claw digs in deep and tears through dozens of tethers. No. Yes. He answers as he feels several souls escape beyond her grip. There's no coming back to life for them, but there's no unnecessary torment. Wherever they end up is of their own making and not hers. Your protection is gone. The uneven odds are in my favor again. To the sound of Horace's cackling over the communicator, Jasper blurs forward and the shadow dodges hard. He still gets a chunk of the halo and there is an outright geyser of spirits fleeing to safety beyond her. Dude, the fuck did you do to my black hole? Charizard demands. Not really the time to explain, just understand that there's going to be one hell of an after-mission report, Jasper replies. There is a strange sensation from the other direction, and Jasper can hear it clearer than ever. She's doing something new. Do you think this means anything? It may have been a long time since I've felt true pain, but that only means it's time to... She dodges the blazing arrow that Jasper launches from his claw. Her monologue gave him a few moments and he was able to determine that axiom effects summoned away from him would have little in the way of the other direction to empower them. But if he launched them from himself as the source, then it was infused from the inside out. The wind blows away the trail of smoke leading off his claw and then reality itself seems to distort as the shadow simply contorts and slams at the barrier between reality and the other direction. Let's play a game, mortal. You wear the power easily enough, but can you really withstand it? I am... A grazer beam slams into the cracks of reality where the other direction is being pulled through and dissipates. The shadow descends into it and lands upon the edge where reality and the other direction meet. The entire halo and all shadows fade away, but the souls become physically visible, twisting, writhing, and screaming as she pulls them in closer. Closer and closer until she's armored in what can only be described as pain made manifest. Jasper flies up and lands on another part of the edge, the soul steel infusing his bones, claws and fur all shimmer and shine, where the infusement into his own blood makes his compound eyes outright glow. Withstand it, woman, you really are the adversarial type. Not everything has to be resisted. Jasper says, what? The shadow demands, that was the one bit of helpful advice you're getting from me, now a command, surrender. Jasper orders her and she seems outright taken aback. You've given me your best, and I've only grown stronger. Surrender. There is a sense of sheer outrage from the woman. Well, whatever diplomacy that could have accomplished has clearly failed. You, you utter wretch. I have not come this far, endured all the insults and false promises to just surrender. As the world fell into degradation and deprivation with the faces of the dead, worn by increasingly worthless copies, I remained. Mercy? Mercy. You offer me mercy. Stupid, wretched Orthani. You should be begging for mine. Her opening attack sends reality shattering to tear open a temporary hole in the other direction. It hits the barrier and it shatters without resistance. The other direction allows things to be as immovable objects. But the problem with something unmovable is that once it is moving, then it's an unstoppable force instead. Even their essences are worthless, barely more than animals, some of them even less. The shadow screams as she gathers a conglomeration of them together and hurls them at him. He catches the souls but is pushed back as they spin and grind against his claws, their tethers shattering against him and the souls departing elsewhere. Then you should have healed them. You could have healed them, could have helped them and grow them into something more. I tried, the shadow screams, twisting them into a cord and lashing out at him. He catches it and begins to sever it. I tried, but I couldn't. No one could because there's nothing to heal. There's not enough to them. I'm carrying hundreds of thousands and even together they're not enough.